Last week we had a good old time. This week we're going to have a good time. Turn in your Bibles to chapter 11 of the book of Hebrews. Chapter 11 of the book of Hebrews as we go. And we continue our lesson in Father Abraham. This is part two of what we talked about last week. Last week we talked about his calling and what happened. He was in Ur, and the message went out, and God said, hey, it's time to go. It's time to go. Well, you got to get out of Ur. I'm going to give you a promised land that can't be taken away from you. And sure enough, Abraham went right then, right there. He didn't ask any questions. He left. Took his family, took his oxen, took his cattle, took his goats, took everything with him, and went out of Ur into the promised land. And there he stayed in tents, not just a couple of days, not just a couple of weeks, not a couple of months, not a couple of years. The rest of his days, he lived in tents. Yeah, he was content too. You want to know how content? We're going to find out just how content he was today. Turn with me over here to verse 17 of chapter 11 of the book of Hebrews. And you're going to find where Abraham is continued to be talked about. By faith, Abraham, when he was tested, offered up Isaac. And he of whom it is said, through Isaac shall your offspring be named. He considered that God was able to even to raise the dead, from which, figuratively speaking, he did receive him back. Now, some of this might sound a little familiar to you if you were here for Resurrection Sunday. We compared... Isaac's, uh, Isaac's situation to Jesus' resurrection. We went through and talked about how Isaac and how Jesus paralleled one another as a type, as what was to come. To fully understand this story, you've got to go back into Genesis chapter 22. You can read verses 1 and 19 if you want to and see the events unfold in Abraham's life. The story begins with Abraham showing us for a second time the nature of faith through prompt obedience. When Abraham was called to go to the land, God showed him. Did Abraham question? Did he say, man, I don't know. I, I got so much planning to do. I got to put my two-week notice in. I got I to gotta go and, and I've got to find ways to be able to get housing and lodging. I got to call ahead get the travel lodge on the phone, get the travel agent ready to go. Did he have all that? Did he do all that? No. He left immediately. As soon as God told him, he was gone. That's what faith is. Prompt faith shows in our obedient nature, our willingness to go and do what God tells us to do. When Abraham was called to go to that land, he picked up and left. In Genesis 22, God tells Abraham to take his one and only son to a mountain and offer him there. And what does that mean, to offer him there? It means he's going to kill him. You know, this one son that he was promised by God, his, the one that all his descendants would come from, that one? Yeah, you're going to go take him up on the mountain there and you're going to kill him now. I don't understand. Why would God do that? That's cruel. God's a liar. Is God a liar? Oh, come on, guys. You know God's not a liar, right? Yeah. God's not a liar. God doesn't lie to us. God will never lie to us. He didn't drag his feet either. A lot of people like to think that they would do the exact same thing if they were in the position. Every time we read somebody in the Bible, I could do that. I would do that. I would make that call. Okay, go take your one and only son outside and kill him. Levi, I'm sorry. <laughs> and it's like, what? <laughs> Levi's looking at me like, no, Dad, no, no, you wouldn't do that. No, I wouldn't. You're right. Because why? That's not put on us to do. That's the good news. But the bad news for Abraham was it was put on him to do. It was put on him to do. And he didn't just do it. He did it promptly. Look at what it says. Abraham in Genesis, or excuse me, in Genesis 22, 3, it says, So Abraham rose early in the morning, saddled the donkey, and took two of his young men with him and his son Isaac. He rose up early in the morning. He didn't pow around. He didn't wait around. He got up out the door of his tent, 
got a couple of donkeys and a couple of the guys and said, hey, let's go, and took Isaac with them. And as we read the story of Genesis, we're told that Abraham went to go and kill his son. He took the knife to slaughter his son. The writer of Hebrews emphasizes this point in verse 17 when he says, he was in the act of offering up his only son. This is the force of the Greek word here. He is offering up. He is in the middle of. He's doing this right now. He's in the act of this. To understand, though, the great faith that is mentioned here, we have to also look at Isaac. Now, we've talked about Isaac in the past. Genesis people love this lesson when we went through the book of Genesis and we went through and we looked at all these different people and we realized just how much like us they really were. Isn't it amazing how much Abraham's like us and Sarah's like us? You know, I find it interesting. I really do. How much our lives parallel those people in the Bible. And I think that's one of the things that our society today shifts from. They say, well, I couldn't relate to those people. Yeah, you can. <laughs> Abraham lied quite a bit. Sarah didn't believe that God could do what he could do. You want proof of that? Just look at the life of Isaac. Isaac was promised to be the coming son of Abraham and Sarah. The one son that they would have together. Remember, Abraham is 100 years old, and Sarah is 90. Sarah is also barren, okay? She can't have kids, okay? So, but when the angel came and said, hey, this is how it's going to happen, Sarah laughed. I got a question for you. Why would you think she would laugh? Helen, angel came up to you today and said, Miss Helen, you're going to have a baby today. What would you say? Be okay. Be okay. <laughs> All right. It's faith. <laughs> That's faith. <laughs> Listen, darling. Darling, now, darling comes up and we say, hey, darling. Angel comes up and says, hey, we know you're past your barren years, but. They can go and sleep with Dr. Nathan. Yeah. Somebody, somebody's going to be looking at some medical reimbursement for some reversing of procedures. Um, yeah. So these things happen. God can do amazing things, okay? God can do some amazing things. Yeah, I remember. Sarah's 90 years old. She can't have babies. And poor old Abraham. It's just Abraham, man. He's old. He can't do it. He can't do things, you know? So what happens? God says, trust in me. God says, trust in me. The fact Sarah tried to take matters in her own hands, telling Abraham to go into Hagar, his handmaid, and have a child so that the inheritance would go to his descendant. No, that didn't work. Why? Because that was our way of doing things. When man does things, everything blows up in our face. When we do things our way, it blows up in our face. It's like when people tell you, all you have to do is believe. Believe in what? You know, you go in deeper and you try to explain to people, what do you mean by just believe? What are you believing in? You see, belief is one thing demons do as well. They don't just believe it, they see it. They saw Jesus. They believe in Jesus and they're scared of him. That's what James says. So if that's the case, then also we have to understand that we as people can believe too, but we better be scared too, and we better be willing to do something that demons don't do and that is obey God. That's the problem. People don't obey God. They don't want to obey God. They're afraid to obey God. Why? Like Sarah. Sarah doesn't think God's capable of doing things. God isn't capable of giving me a child. God isn't capable of meeting this need. Because I'm barren, right? And so she laughs. Now, when Ishmael came along, it seemed like Abraham and believed that the promise would be fulfilled through Ishmael. But God said 
that Ishmael would not be the one. As it says in Genesis 17, 19, God said, No, but Sarah, your wife, shall bear you a son, and you shall call his name Isaac. I will establish my covenant with him as an everlasting covenant uh, for his offspring after him. Isaac was the son of promise. There's no question of that. Isaac was the one. How do I know that? Because if you look in Genesis chapter 21, what happens to Ishmael? He gets thrown out. Hagar and Ishmael get thrown out. They're gone. They're banished. But what happens to Isaac in chapter 22? You're going to take your son, your one and only son, up on the hill, and you're going to kill him. Wait a minute. Is God double speaking here? Ah. God works in mysterious ways. And this proves beyond a shadow of a doubt the faith of Abraham and what we need to be when our faith seems like it's getting shaken. The timing of this command cannot be missed. Hagar and Ishmael left in 21. Isaac is left in chapter 22 by himself. It's the only possible child left. They go to the hill. He's been identified by name as the one through whom the covenant and the promise would be fulfilled. So as we read through Genesis, we want to know how Abraham doesn't argue with God. We want to know how Abraham was arising early in the morning and going out and taking his son on a hill to tie him to an altar and have him sacrifice up to God. We want to know these things. How does he trust God this much? And how can I do that? The writer of Hebrews gives a staggering, a staggering answer. He considered God to be able to raise someone from the dead from which he also got him back as an illustration. I want you to soak in the words of Hebrews eleven nineteen with me here. Look at those words again. Highlight them if you want to. He considered God to be able even to raise someone from the dead from which he also got him back as an illustration. <clears throat> Abraham believed that God was able to raise somebody from the dead. We talked about this on Resurrection Sunday. I'm going to ask you a question. Let's see how biblically literate you are. From Genesis chapter 1 to Genesis chapter 22, how many people resurrected? How many people resurrected from the dead? And there's a lot of death between Genesis chapter 1 and Genesis chapter 22, isn't there? Think about it. The flood. In Genesis chapter 6 through 8, the flood took place. What about in, chapter, in Genesis chapter 18 and 19? What about Sodom and Gomorrah? What happened there? Were any of them resurrected from the dead? Was Lot's wife resurrected from the dead? Nope. How many resurrections took place between Genesis chapter 1 and Genesis chapter 22? Nada. Zero. Nobody had resurrected from the dead. Once you're dead, you're dead. How do we know that? Because that's exactly what the scripture says from Genesis chapter 1 to Genesis chapter 22. Once you're dead, you're dead. Once you're dead, you're dead. You don't come back. There's no resurrecting. Even Enoch, who didn't die, who was taken away by God. Where's Enoch? He's not around. <laughs> so that's where we have to ask the question. How many people resurrected? None. This is what faith Abraham had. Abraham was taking Isaac up to the hill. I want you to look at the words he says in Genesis 22 when he gets ready to leave and he tells the guys, he said, you all stay here with the donkeys. You guys stay here with the donkeys. Me and the boy are going to go worship. And when we get done, we'll go home. When we return, many scripture verses will say in Genesis 22, when we return. They never say when I return. None of them do. The word we is always used in Genesis 22 to talk about when Abraham returns after the sacrifice. We. Why is that? 
Because that's how much faith Abraham had that Isaac was coming back with him. He had the faith to know that, that no matter what happened, God was going to keep his word. Abraham knew that God was going to keep his word. He was going to keep his vow. He was going to keep his promise. Isaac was either going to resurrect from the dead or God was going to find another way to save his son. And so we're asking the question, if resurrection didn't happen, was this blind, ridiculous faith in God? Nope. The basis of his faith was that God said that Isaac was the child of promise and the covenant would be established through him. How old was Abraham when Isaac was born again? Y'all say that. How old? He was 100. 100 year old man. And how old was Sarah? 90, right? So you got a 100 year old man and a 90 year old woman having a baby. He has faith that this child is the chosen one who's going to lead the nation of Israel, the promised nation that God has said would be established. He has faith in that. So much so that he is willing to go and sacrifice his only son for that. God said it was Isaac. So if God tells me to offer Isaac, then God will raise Isaac from the dead. When God said the words, Abraham knew that those words and on those words, that he could hang his life upon them. He knew that God's words would come to pass. He didn't have any worries. He didn't have any doubts. But everybody today sure does, don't they? When God's word speaks, we're supposed to listen. Maybe God was going to raise Isaac from the dead. Maybe he was going to find another way to be able to preserve him. Whatever the case. God did keep his promise. Why? Because true faith is the ability to anchor our lives upon God's promises so that we are not shaken. Let me repeat that. True faith is the ability to anchor our lives upon God's promises so that we are not shaken shaken. When somebody comes and tells me, what do I need to do to be saved? I always go back to scripture and I say, believe, repent, confess, and be baptized. And continue living in the newness of life. Why? Is it because that's what the church believes? No. It's what the body of Christ believes and it's what God's word says. It's not what the building does. It's what God says. When God says, we do. We don't question it. We just do it. We don't plan ahead. We don't think about 20 months down the road. We don't think about three years down the road. We don't think about a lifetime down the road. No, we go and we say, I gotta do something about this. And that's what Abraham's doing. His faith is in the promise of God. God's word is a promise. God's Bible, God's Testament in there, in God's word, are promises that are made so that you can anchor your hope to have that kind of faith that Abraham has. What about some life anchors? Do I got some? Well, how about 1 Corinthians 10, 13? No testing has overtaken you that is not common to everyone. God is faithful, and he will not let you be tested beyond your strength, but the testing will also provide the way out so that you may be able to endure it. Will we hold on to this promise in face of difficulty in the times that are to come? As true believers, God promises he's not going to leave us alone, and there will be a door so we can get out. What about in Hebrews 13, 5, and 6? It says, your life should be free from the love of money. Be satisfied with what you have. For he himself said, I will never leave or forsake you. Therefore, we may boldly say, the Lord is my helper. I will not be afraid. What can man do to me? It's the truth. Abraham didn't worry about his job. He didn't worry about his time. He didn't worry about his family. What he worried about was loving God. 
When you love God, it'll trickle down to everything else you do. Whether it's loving your family more, spending more time with your family, loving your job, encouraging those people that work with you, whatever the case is, God's going to help you. God's also going to help you see when you need to leave in certain circumstances. If something happens, if something divides you from him, if something is causing you chaos in your life, God will provide a means for you to leave. He will provide a door out of the trouble. If we confess our sins, he is faithful and righteous to forgive us our sins and cleanse us of all unrighteousness. 1 John 1, 9, 1, 9 says, that's another anchor. We can always go to God and he will always forgive. We have to be willing to turn our backs away from the world, away from what this world wants and back to what God wants, striving for obedience. There are so many other anchors that we can use and find within the entirety of scripture. Hebrews 11 is just one part of that faith and anchor building. Guys, take time out to spend time with God and study his word. Get into a relationship with God. You want to build your faith? Do you want your faith to get stronger? Then the first place you have to go is to his word. When you go into his word and you start studying his word and praying, praying reverently to him and seeking his face, the words are going to come right to you. It's going to lay into your heart, and you're going to say, I know what I need to do. It happens. I know. Now, the answers might not be quick and easy. They may be very difficult. It's where a drug addict can look and say, I have hope because God's word says I can rely on him. He's not going to leave me alone. I'm going to trust and help to overcome this addiction. It's the same kind of hope that a divorcee has. Somebody that has been divorced by their spouse because uh, the spouse has, been in, in, has had an infidelity issue or maybe the individual has had an infidelity issue. Can infidelity be forgiven? Absolutely. God can forgive infidelity. But you've got to be willing to change that life and you've got to get back to basics. What about when somebody is losing hope and they want to end it? Yes, there's hope in there too. God is with you. We are with you. It's one of the reasons I tell people who are contemplating that situation, that scenario, to call me first. Text me, whatever you need to do. And we'll talk about it. I'll call you right then, right there. I'll come over to your house. We'll pray about it together. We'll work together. We'll walk together. Because there is no good answer that comes from that except to come back and put down the fear, the worry, and the doubt and give it to God. There's no greater answer than God, no matter what we do. God will always seek to be there for us. He will always seek to help us in our time of need. He will never leave us. He will never give up on us. We tend to be the ones to give up on him. But he won't give up on us. Read the scripture. Find those anchors and use them to encourage your life. Now in Hebrews eleven nineteen, it tells us, as a figure, Abraham did, did, did receive Isaac back from the dead. It's an interesting statement. Say that as a figure or as a figure of speech or any of that stuff. Well, there's all sorts of different versions of that, but the true word that's used there is parable. That's the Greek word, parable. Same word that means parable. You all know what a parable is, right? You've heard the parable of the sower, you've heard the parable of the fig, the parable of the mustard seed, you've heard these things, right? You know, when Jesus says, have faith like a mustard seed, or how about when Jesus says, the kingdom of heaven is like, that's a parable. 
He is making a comparison between two things. God is making a comparison between two things. We talked about that during Resurrection Sunday. We talked about how God used Abraham and Isaac to show his love for every single man, woman, and child on this planet when he gave his only son, his one and only son, Jesus, to die on the cross of Calvary. Is that making sense now? Is it starting to show Abraham's faith was so much like that of what God expected that it would be what God pointed to and said, look, this is how it needs to be. This is how faith needs to be. This, this is a symbol for the time, present time. Talking about the writer of Hebrews in chapter 9, in verse 9 it reads, this is a symbol for the present time during which gifts and sacrifices are offered that can't not, and cannot perfect the worshiper's conscience. The tabernacle in Hebrews chapter 9 was used as a parable, as a symbol for something that would happen in the present time. In the present time, what was going on in the writer of Hebrews time? It was Jesus. Jesus was the one who would be the one who would push back sins, who would not just push back sins, but would eradicate sins from your life. Therefore, the offering of Isaac was a parable or a symbol for something else. Upon closer analysis, it becomes clear that the parable is what God would have to do in offering his one and only son. Just as Abraham was willing to go and give his one and only son up, God had to be willing to do that too. That's how much faith Abraham had to act just as God would do. And what did God do? God provided a replacement for Isaac. A, thorn, a, a ram with his horn stuck in the, thorn, in the thorn bush. And they went and they picked him up and they sacrificed and they worshiped God. Isaac is called Abraham's only son. John 3, 16 makes the same point that God so loved the world that he gave his only son. In fact, the same Greek word to describe Abraham's son and Jesus are in those passages. The very same words. And since this is a parable, let's create this comparison. God the Father was going to offer his son for us to take our sins away. Hebrews 7.27 tells us that Jesus offered himself once and for all, for all time, on our behalf. When Jesus is on the cross, there wasn't anybody to stop him. There wasn't anyone to stop God and say, well, God, I got a replacement for you. No. God had to do what had to be done in order to save you, me, and the people we love. Father was not going to be spared the pain of offering his only son. Even though Abraham had been spared that pain, God would not. The comparison is a resurrection. Abraham received his son at the end. Jesus, after being resurrected and laid in the tomb, three days later rose and joined with his father again in glory at his right hand to bring home every single lost soul that sought his face and wanted to believe and obey the one true God. True faith is seen in prompt obedience. True faith is about anchoring our lives to God's promises. I'm asking you this morning, have you done that yet? Have you anchored yourself to God's word, to God's promises? Are you trusting in God enough that you'd be willing to do anything for him? Anything. Now, I know that's a hard question to answer. That's what God wants you to do. He wants you to answer that question truthfully. Are you willing to give everything up for him? I'm not talking money. I'm not talking time. I'm not talking power. I'm not talking all that. I'm talking about are you willing to give your life for God? Are you willing to give up everything you think is good and start being and serving 
a God who is good, to love him as he has loved you, that he's willing to die for you, that he is willing to give his very best for you. True faith is about anchoring our lives on God's promises. One of God's promises can be done today. You can come to know Jesus. Why do I love Jesus so much? Why do I continue to preach Jesus all these years later? It's been 20 years I've been preaching. Why do I keep preaching? I'll tell you exactly why. Because heaven is real, and so is hell. And I believe in both heaven and hell. And I believe every person in this room will make a choice between heaven and hell. I believe every person outside the doors of this building will choose heaven or hell. And the choices they make will last eternity. So why am I saying it? Because I love you. I love each and every one of you that are sitting in the pews today. I love each and every soul that is made in the image of God that sits in front of us today. I want to see you all get to heaven. I don't just want to sing when we all get to heaven. I want us all to be in heaven. And you can do that today. You can make that decision to follow him today and make that eternal judgment on God to be taken care of through your faith in him by believing in him, believing in the Son, Jesus Christ, repenting of your sin, turning your life over to him, confessing Jesus Christ is the Son of the living God, to be baptized for the forgiveness of sins and to receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. And they don't stop. They don't stop. There is no faith only. There is no baptism only. There's no, uh, there's no believe only. There's none of that stuff. This only, only stuff. It's a lifestyle we choose and we pick up. And we do it every single day. You keep running the race. That's what Abraham did. That's what I want to do, and that's what I want to see you do. And we can help you. I want to help you. I want you to help me. Guys, I need all the help I can get. Look at me. I mean, come on, guys. <laughs> I need help. We all need help. Will you make that promise to God today? And will he be able to seal that promise on you today?